Hi, welcome to the Creationism Honor Presentation. My name is Gerard Zavosky. I'm with the Southern New England Conference. I'm an area coordinator. Um, and please bear with me. Uh, there might be dog barking in the background. Uh, might be some interruptions. I'm going to try to make this as seamless as possible, though. Uh, I will be glancing away periodically to look at notes uh, and whatnot. Um, so, first time I've ever done a video like this, so I appreciate uh, your patience with me. Um, in order to earn this honor, you need to attend this presentation remotely, of course, and you need to visit a zoo or aquarium, a park, a nursery, or some other place like that um, where you can be with the the outdoors in the out, outside. Um, I feel a backyard or a local woodlot uh, is perfectly acceptable. Um, there's plenty of places where we can see God's creation, uh, the miracles that God has provided each and every one of us um, all over the place. So you just uh, use your uh, imagination and, and find some open uh, wooded or grassy spa space and uh, do a report write up a report and give it to your uh, director uh, to earn this honor. Um, everything for the honor, with the exception of that report, will be covered in this presentation. Um, that said, um, I don't follow the requirements step by step. Um, I kind of bounce around a little bit. Um, hopefully it'll be easy to digest. Um, I'm going to be covering science, which both supports and doesn't support uh, creationism. Um, I'm going to giving some examples of some things. There's going to be some math equations involved, uh, but uh, it's what's really important for you to understand during this is not so much the math um, and the details of the science behind it, but to understand why certain things don't fit in with uh, creationism and why some of the things that uh, scientists today use to um, promote evolution uh, really don't fit um, a good standard. So it's kind of a miracle that I'm here uh, actually speaking about this because um, about 12 years ago I didn't believe in creationism. I believed in evolution. Um, I believed in a very old earth and that's the evolutionist model. And um, So we'll go to the next slide here. So the evolutionist model says there's no intelligent designer the world and the universe was made in a few billion years, and the world is billions of years old. That's where I used to be 12 years ago. Um, but the good Lord prodded me and uh, changed me, and now I am following the creationist model. Uh, the creationist model is that we believe in a supernatural designer, that the world was made in six literal days, and the world is only a few thousand years old. Um, but not everybody uh, feels this way, of course. Uh, and I have an obsession, or I guess you could say an addiction with the outdoors. Um, and uh, I love it. I love being outdoors. Um, I love seeing God's creation. Some say that uh, the outdoors or nature is God's second book um, of of his love and his compassion, the first being the Bible. Um, some people find my thoughts on this uh, disturbing, how much I like to be outside. Um, and not everyone understands my faith, and I'm sure that you've all probably had similar situations. Not everybody understands my faith, how God created this world and what he's given to us. Um, and this is really no surprise this is happening. The, the Bible even says it's going to happen. In the second book of Peter, in chapter 3 and verse 3, um, Peter writes, Knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days. Uh, that was written nearly 2,000 years ago, and it's truer today than it ever was before. So, what happened to bring the scoffers? What happened to bring um, the people that um, f have fallen away from uh, creationism and believing that God created this wonderful world that we have. Um, was it a single event? Was it uh, a series of events? Was it a loss of faith? Um, well, we're going to find out some of those things. Uh, so
So for more than five and a half thousand years, the world was known to have been created as stated in the Bible, more specifically in the book of Genesis chapter 1. Other religions and groups of people believe similarly that our earth and we were created by an omnipotent being, created by God. Then early in the 19th century, something changed. Oh sure, uh, there were stirrings and weakening of beliefs for years, but uh, those usually got um, muted by the uh, big support of the churches. Um, but an event in 1831 really is the, the turning point that changed everything. Uh, two days after Christmas in 1831, a ship named the HMS Beagle sailed from a port near Plymouth, England. On board was a young naturalist, Charles Darwin, and I'm sure we've all heard of Charles Darwin. His observation and his subsequent writings, specifically on the origin of a species, published in 1859, that started a chain of events which erupted into a worldwide debate. That debate is, did our Earth evolve or was it created? The voyage of the Beagle placed uncertainty in the minds of many. It muddled their faith and it caused doubt, an uncertainty, a lack of conviction for the truth. The same doubt occurred around 6,000 years ago. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 when Satan said to Eve, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And then in verse 4 and 5, Satan continues, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And again, that's Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Uh, so that was doubt, uncertainty, and a lapse of faith that led Eve and Adam down a dark road. And um, the world was never the same, as we know that. Um, that same dark road still exists today, and it seems to be getting very easy to travel. And in her book, Education, Ellen White says, those who wish to doubt have opportunity, but those who desire to know truth find ample ground for faith. And that's so true, and there are truths all around. These truths can be found in science and in the Bible, but we need to be willing to open our hearts and accept what God has given to us. So I'm a believer that God, our God, everyone's God, created the earth as we know it in seven days and much more recently than is purported by many. As the study of science evolved, so has knowledge of our great planet we call Earth. Many in the fields of science argue that the great discoveries, including evolution of the 19th and 20th century, have shattered the story of creation. They will tell you that as science has evolved, so has our understanding of the past. The same science is also useful to propose a case against evolution, and more importantly, for creation by one truly omnipotent God. So, what is science? Well, we have a scientific model. So the scientific model seeks to represent empirical objects or, or actual physical objects, phenomena, and physical processes in a logical and objective way. Building and disputing models is fundamental to the scientific enterprise. So that means coming up with an ideal, working through it, and trying to find out if it's, if it's true or false. Complete and true representation may be impossible, but scientific debate often concerns which is the better model for a given task. So, um, if you ever watch like the Weather Channel or anything, they use uh, uh, meteorologists use different models for uh, different types of storm systems, um, depending on where you are in the world. Different continents use different models depending on their typical weather patterns. And the same thing here. Different models are used um, in different um, branches of science um, to determine different things. There's some models that work well for some things and some that don't. And so those um, models are used, uh, so the example that's given there is 
for accurate climate model for seasonal forecasting. Um, and then you have scientific theory. And a scientific theory is a well-substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world that is acquired through the scientific method and repeatedly confirmed through observation and experimentation. As with most, if not all, forms of scientific knowledge, scientific theories are inductive in nature and aim for predictive power and explanatory force. So what that means is that the scientific theories um, try to induce more um, thought, more um, experimentation that can prove itself. So you have a theory and in order to prove that theory, you need to do more experimentation, and you um, it induces um, gets more force and power behind that theory. Um, but the fact of the matter is that a theory is just that; it's a theory. Um, if it's proven, it's no longer a theory; it's a fact. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as we go through this. So there are many fields of science which are relevant to both creationism and the theory of evolution. I selected a few to go over and will demonstrate how these fields of science can be used in favor of a creationist model. One such field of science which is frequently discussed and can be difficult to comprehend is radioactive dating. Um, so I was uh, worked in radiation health for uh, 35 years. So this is something that is very near and dear to my heart and this was one of the big stumbling blocks that I had in um, accepting creation um, over evolution. But once God put this bug in my ear, um, that was the end of it. And uh, now I'm a, a firm believer in creationism and I have completely eschewed the uh, some of the radioactive dating stuff that's used today. So it's uh, considered the gold standard to support a long age Earth, and it can be confusing to understand, but it's a good place to start, and this will be actually the most difficult thing I discussed today, so, um, and again, like I said at the beginning, don't worry if you don't uh, capture all the science and the details behind it. What's important is that you understand why this doesn't work. Um, so probably most of you have heard the term of radiocarbon dating um, and uh, that's something that's very common. There's also thorium dating, uh, uranium dating. Um, so basically there's 92 naturally occurring elements on Earth and here's a periodic table of the elements that has some of the non-natural ones as well. And some elements like carbon-14 are naturally radioactive and can be found in all living things. But carbon-14 doesn't stay radioactive forever. It loses half its radioactivity about every 6,000 years or so. And that's what's called its half-life. So half its radioactivity every about 6,000 years. Um, and a half-life is defined as the time required for something to fall to half of its initial value. And so here we have on the screen uh, carbon-14. You can see you have carbon-14, it decays to nitrogen-14 and it gives off some radiation. And that's what the radiation is detected when they do carbon-14 dating. Um, so a, a good way to kind of look at this is if you're playing cards with a group of friends and you have a pile of peanuts, um, if you have a half-life of the peanuts, let's say you eat half the pile of peanuts every five minutes. So you have a start with a pile of peanuts. Five minutes later, you have half the peanuts are gone, and now you have created um, a half pile worth of peanut shells. And then in another five minutes, half of that original the pile that was left, so now you have a quarter of the peanuts left. And then it'll go down to an eighth after five more minutes. So you keep cutting those, uh, those peanuts in half. Um, so scientists use the steady half-life, which for carbon-14 is about 6,000 years, to tell us how long something has been dead. Now comes the math, the hard part. Um, so how you do it is you count the number of carbon-14 atoms in a sample, say of a piece of bone that you dug up today, 
and compare it to the amount of carbon-14 when the animal was alive, and then using a relatively, it's a it's pretty simple equation, um, you know, can figure out how old it is, right? So you got, this is the carbon-14, your final amount. This is your carbon-14 initial amount. Uh, you have E, that's the exponent, and you raise E to this number. And here's the time, and that's what the scientists want to solve is the time. So, do you see the problem already that's inherent with this? So, to determine the amount of time you have, you solve for time. So you take the natural log, and if you understand math a little bit, you can figure this out. If you don't, feel free to contact me, and I can walk you through it. But in order to solve for time, you need to know how much carbon-14 you have now and how much carbon-14 you had when you started. But unless you were around to sample that, you don't know. And that is the problem. You can't have a variable on both sides of the equation. Um, if you knew how old that, uh, that bone or that fossil was, um, then you wouldn't need to use carbon-14 dating. So in order to use carbon-14 dating, you need to know how old something is to begin with or how much carbon it had in the beginning. And so what scientists will tell you is they've come up with some theories and speculations that um, they assume that the Earth has been constant or steady for billions of years, but no one was alive back then and the steadiest or constant rate of radioactive decay has recently been shown to be not so stable. So it's discovered that the half-life can be changed by altering the speed of the material, by changing the electrical properties, or by showering the material with more radiation. So old earth theorists make certain assumptions regarding radioactive decay and the state of the earth, and they use those as assumptions to assert proofs of theory. They frequently fail to pursue lines of research which contradict their assumptions. So again, nobody was there that's alive right now was there when God created the earth. We have no idea what was going on. So who knows what the half-lives of things were back then, for one thing. And who knows how much radioactive carbon-14 or radioactive uranium or thorium were in the ground or in objects at that time. So unless you know what was there to begin with, you cannot figure out how much time has elapsed. Um, so I'm going to take a break now. We're going to take a short break, and then I'm going to continue in just a few more minutes.
Okay, welcome back. So we ended off with uh, talking about uh, half-life uh, equations and how um, when people use uh, radioactive dating, that doesn't always uh, doesn't always support evolution. Um, so uh, I want to talk about some dissenters. So they're dissenters, scientists that uh, don't believe um, in evolution, and they're uh, very uh, well educated scientists. And in fact, there's a book here, um, just a little advertising, in six days. It's a very good book. It's about 50 scientists who choose to believe in creation. It's a very, very good book if you're interested in that. Uh, some other good books to read um, are uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, there's a chapter in there that's really, really good. And of course, the best book is the Bible. Um, this has everything you really want to know about creation in it. Um, so those are the uh, three books that I would recommend, and um, the Bible being the first one to go to uh, for uh, details. Um, so some of the dissenters, the scientists, um, as I mentioned, there are plenty of them. One of them is Robert Gentry. Um, he received a master's degree in physics from the University of Florida, and then he worked in the defense industry um, in nuclear weapons research. And in 1959, he was influenced by a verse he read in the Bible while looking at what he refers to as halos. Um, the verse he read in the Bible is uh, Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So based on this verse and his extensive work, he became convinced of a young earth. He entered a doctoral program at the Georgia Institute of Technology, but he was refused permission to use the age of the earth for his doctoral dissertation. Many scientific journals uh, refuse to print his research, claiming that they ignore, and this is a quote, virtually the entire body of geological knowledge. So whose knowledge? Many great discoveries have contradicted existing knowledge in medicine, biology, car emissions, etc. So why not in geology? So Mr. Gentry, he refers to these halos as fingerprints of creation. And here's some some microscopic images of these radioactive uh, hay or that the Halos aren't radioactive, they're formed by radioactive decay of pl polonium and some other radioactive elements. Um, on his website named Halos, Mr. Gentry provides a simple analogy using, of all things, Alka-Seltzer. So he says if granite, so these radioactive halos are found in granite um, and other rocks, he says if the granite was created over long periods of time, the halos would have dissipated and disappeared in the rock as it was being formed, just like bubbles do in a glass of seltzer. So if you pour a glass of seltzer and you let it sit on the counter for a while, the bubbles will form, but over time, those bubbles will eventually dissipate and be absorbed into the, uh, the water. Um, but the fact that the halos remain demonstrate that the granite was formed instantaneously. So example, if you took a glass of seltzer and froze it instantly, those bubbles would still be captured inside of there. So he's, what Robert Gentry found was that the fact that he can see these halos or these little bubbles inside the granite shows that it was formed instantaneously and wasn't formed over millions of years of heating and then millions of years of cooling. So in summary, he states that, um, and here's a, just a little drawing of a uh, shows slow cooling molten granite, no halos, and instantly created cold granite, you get the radio halos. So in summary, he states that many of these uh, polonium halos provide undeniable evidence that a sea of primordial matter quickly froze into solid granite. says the occurrence of these polonium halos then distinctly implies that our earth was formed in a very short time in complete harmony with the biblical record of creation. 
So that's just one great example of using science to support the Bible, not oppose it. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 6 through 9, we find the narrative of the Great Flood. So many cultures around the world have similar accounts of a global flooding event, yet there are many non-believers. The flood is not only discussed in Genesis, but also many times in the New Testament. So if we look in Luke 17, 27, um, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, uh, Luca, by faith, down. Noah, being divine, div divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark. And we know how that finished. In 1 Peter 3.20, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water, and in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, But save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood in the world of the ungodly. So, let's talk about the flood. So, here's a picture that I'm sure most of you have uh, seen an image of this uh, area. This is the Grand Canyon located in the southwestern United States. I haven't seen it yet. It's on my uh, so-called bucket list. I really want to see it one of these days soon. Um, but to say it's grand is probably an understatement. It's enormous. It's more than 250 miles long, uh, up to 20 miles wide, and a mile deep in some places. So how old is the Grand Canyon? Well, most writings place the age at around 5 million years old, but some say 17 million, some also say 70 million, and then there are others that say it's 400 million years old. Apparently, no one really knows for sure just how old the Grand Canyon is, but it's assumed to be some multiple of millions of years old because that's how long it takes sediments to turn to stone and then have water erode the stone to create the magnificent work of art. Right? Wrong. Geology has recently uncovered a vast amount of information related to deposition of material and massive flooding upon the earth and the altering of the landscape that uh, ensues. The formation of layers in the canyon is based on deposition rates of mud, dirt, sand, and silt over long periods of time. However, if you use standard deposition rates of a flash flood, you can achieve the same deposition displayed in the Grand Canyon in 8.4 months. So if we do a little teeny bit of math and look in Genesis chapter 7, it states that the flood um, was 40 days of flooding and then the water sat upon the earth for 150 days. Um, that just comes out to just over six months. Do you think that's coincidence um, that you can achieve that same deposition rate uh, that you see in the Grand Canyon in 8.4 months using standard accepted scientific models of deposition? I don't think it's coincidence. Not one bit. Um, and science has also shown that some large-scale flooding events, some of those recorded in the United States, can create substantial sculpting of rock in very short periods of time. Take, for example, the Missoula floods. So these were cataclysmic or large-scale earth-shattering floods that swept across eastern Washington and down the Columbia River Gorge. These floods were a result of sudden ruptures of ice dams in the northern U.S. around the Montana area and up into Canada. After each dam rupture, the waters of the lake would rush down and flood much of eastern Washington east and into western Oregon. The, the flow of the uh, individual flood has been estimated to be 9.5 to 15 cubic miles of water per hour. Surfs up, right? I mean, that's a lot of water. It's cubic miles of water per hour, with the maximum flows up to 80 miles an hour. And up to 1.9 times 10 to the 19 joules of energy were released by each flood. That's a lot of energy. 
Um, if anybody does any engineering work, um, then you would know how, just how much uh, energy that is. Um, so that's equivalent to 4,500 4, megatons of TNT as far as energy release. So if you compare that to the largest U.S. nuclear test of a mere 15 megatons, the energy of the Missoula floods equals 300 of our largest nuclear blast. The cumulative effect of the floods excavated 50 cubic miles of sediment and rock from eastern Washington and transported it downstream. So one only needed to travel to western Massachusetts and southern Vermont in the fall of 2011 to see the devastation wrought by a mere 12 inches of rain. And here's a, a picture of uh, from Tropical Storm Irene. Um, 12 inches of rain over about a day and a half, not 40 days, a day and a half, uh, completely altered the landscape, wiped out towns, um, bridges, uh, communities, uh, roads, um, eroded very, very quickly. So scientists state that these cat cataclysmic drainage events, the Missoula events, were of such magnitudes that they had significant impact on climate, sea, um, level and possibly early human civilization. Sometimes scientists have even suggested that these floods, and this is, I find this to be kind of interesting, scientists have suggested that these floods may also account for various flood myths of prehistoric cultures, including the biblical flood narrative. So I have to ask this question. If they can account for the biblical flood, then why call it a myth? Uh, talking some more about the flood, we have uh, from uh, Robert Ballard. He's a retired U.S. Naval officer and a professor of oceanography. He found something very interesting. 400 feet below the surface in the Black Sea, uh, they unearthed an ancient shoreline. And that was proof to Ballard that a catastrophic event did happen in the Black Sea. Ballard said he believes that they have established a timeline for the catastrophic event which he estimated to be around 5000 BC. Some experts believe that this is around the time when Noah's flood could have occurred. And I think we're going to take another break right now. Um, so again, we left off with Robert Ballard um, and with the flood. If there's any questions again, uh, feel free to uh, shoot an email or save them, uh, bring them up on the Zoom meeting. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back again. So we finished off last time discussing the Great Flood and how the deposition or the layering of material um, has been shown that it could be done in a very short period of time and how um, some massive flooding can create vast amounts of damage um, in a very short period of time, which is completely um, consistent with the um, the flood uh, during Noah's time. Um, now I want to move on to actual evolution, which um, it uses biology, which is the primary field of science that's used to support evolution. Um, so I'm sure we've all seen this picture. Uh, this is called the ascent of man. It's the image which shows a chimpanzee or some sort of monkey gradually changing into a man. Uh, a man. Sadly, this is taught in most public schools as fact, that this is how it really, really happens. So many believe that this is true because we share 96% of our DNA or our genetic material that makes us who we are with chimpanzee. Well, this is true. Um, I don't think anyone would deny that. We also share about 50% of our DNA with many vegetables. So, you know, but that doesn't mean that this cabbage is related to me. I mean, it may look like me, but it's only 50% of my DNA. Um, so why do we share our DNA? Because on a cellular level, or what we're made out of, we do have similar characteristics. So any great engineer or designer will reuse a process or a pattern that works well. And we had the best engineer of all designing us. So. Regarding evolution, how would Jesus respond to the question if he was asked, Lord, did we evolve from lower life forms and primates? Well, he already answered that when he responded uh, as recorded by Mark in chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Well, he says it right there. So what is evolution? Well, According to the Oxford English Dictionary, evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are believed to have developed from earlier forms during the history of Earth. And I put a little hmm down here, and uh, this little guy's looking at the word believed. And I have uh, emphasized that word for a reason, um, because despite what is taught in most schools, evolution is theory, not a fact. So how is evolution supposed to work? Well, evolution relies on chance, the probability that a mutation or a change in an organism will occur, which improves an organism and also requires time, long, long periods of time. And this is becoming, or has become, today's widely recognized theory of where and when life started from. A hundred years ago, um, Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, there is a constant effort made to explain the work of creation as the result of natural causes and human reasoning as accepted even by professed Christians in opposition to plain scripture facts. And that's in Patriarchs and Prophets on page 113. So this was observed uh, more than 100 years ago, and it's occurring more frequently today. This thinking is accepted not only by scientists, but, and this is very scary, is also accepted, as Mrs. White states, by many Christians. Yes, Christians. There is a trend towards a liberal interpretations of the Bible. Take, for example, a quote um, 2007 from Pope Benedict XVI. He says, On one hand, there is much scientific proof in favor of evolution, which appears as a reality that we must see and which enriches our understanding of life and being as such. That came from the Pope. Um, so he seems to be in support of evolutionary theory. There's even a term for the coexistence of creation and evolution. 
It's called day age creationism. So this idea claims that the days in Genesis are not days, but ages, years, or millions of years. Believers of day age creationism argue that a verse in 2 Peter states this to be true. Specifically, 2 Peter 3.8 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. So the um, day age creationism believe that in 2 Peter 3.8, that one day is a thousand years, that in Genesis, when God is speaking about a day, that he's actually maybe talking about a thousand or millions of years. But if you read the remainder of the verse, which I think a lot of people miss, it says, and a thousand years is as one day. So that may seem to be contradictory or doesn't make sense. That, that seems like it's saying the same thing, kind of twisted around a little bit. But the verse in the context is explaining the timelessness of God. He's not bound by time as we are. God doesn't use clocks. He doesn't need clocks. He's eternal. He's endless. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The Bible is pretty clear about how long a creation day is, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But there are scientists who still hold truths as written in the Bible, and some evolutionists also just seem to be confused themselves. So here's a quote, and it's truly remarkable. To suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I confess, absurd in the highest degree. And that was quoted by Charles Darwin. He is the father, or what we call the father of uh, what is known as the theory of evolution. So a lot of time can be spent discussing how science provides challenges to evolution, but there are examples in which science completely refutes the evolutionary theory. And it's just that a theory. So evolution assumes that over time a species will improve and become better and actually become new species through mutations or changes to their genes, their chromosomes. So do mutations improve individuals? Well a mutation is a relatively permanent change in hereditary material or our DNA or chromosomes that involves either a change in chromosome structure or the change the number of chromosomes or a change in how the genes that make up a chromosome how they are made um, so mutations are predominantly disruptive they tend towards a loss of information and complexity in other words mutations break things down they make things um, less good um, a mutation makes something uh, less usable, usually. Um, so how can a loss of valuable, useful genetic information over time result in more complex creatures? Some evolutionists argue, this is pretty interesting, they argue that although there are more harmful mutations than favorable mutations, it's the sheer number of mutations that create new, better organisms. Think about that for a second. Does that make any sense? Well, no, it doesn't. And a doctor, an American physicist, Dr. Lee Spetner, he says that uh, believing that large numbers of harmful mutations can create a better organism is like a merchant who loses money on every sale but believes he can make up for the difference in sales volume. The math doesn't work. If you're losing genetic information or you're losing money um, overall, the end result is going to be a loss of uh, either money, if you're a salesman, or the loss of good quality genetic information. Another uh, science that is used to explain evolutionary theory is paleontology. So we see right here that mutations and evolution don't jive. The paleontology, that's a science that deals with the life of past geological periods as known from fossil remains. So this is quite possibly the most publicized field of science used to demonstrate evolution. But it, again, it really doesn't. 
There are two issues with this. One, radioactive dating, which we already discussed um, on the, the very first uh, video. Um, we've shown that radioactive dating, unless you know how old something was to begin with, you can't tell how old it was now. Um, so that's the first issue. The second issue, and to me is the, the most obvious to anybody that, that just looks at just the, from a big picture point of view, is the number of fossils. If evolution were true, then where are the fossils of the millions of mutated forms which supposedly existed as life evolved? If man evolved from apes, there should be an excess of fossils showing the millions of years of change that took place from loss of hair, smaller teeth, uh, shorter arms, etc. So the fossil record is missing not just some, but the vast majority of the record to support evolution. We can find the early forms of life and the latter forms of life, but the reality is there should be much more of what's in between, and we can't find any of that. The in, there should be uh, much more than the long ago and much more than the present. The stuff from the in-between, they're called missing links. There's a reason for that. They're missing. Um, one example of this are the trilobite fossils. These are little teeny, um, they kind of look like bugs, uh, little creatures that lived in the mud and the bottom of the oceans years ago. Uh, the tribalite fossils are found in the Grand Canyon. There's a layer of them which appear to have succumbed to a massive flooding event. Um, but there are none um, older than that, and there are none younger than that. So all they, we have are trilobites from this one period, no older and no younger. Um, so again, looking at this slide, we have a long time ago, present day, there should be millions and millions of fossils to support um, an evolutionary change of uh, creatures in th that, uh, that time period. But it's missing, and again, it's missing link. So the, the fossil record doesn't support uh, evolution at all. So the fossil record does show a strong evidence of decay and steady loss of deterioration of species, not an upward trend of perfection as th what's theorized by the theory of evolution. So when did this decay start? I believe we can find the answer in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, God says, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. So that, I believe, is where the uh, mutations became that steady decline in uh, the species as we see them now. So evolution in the fossil record doesn't connect. So how did we change our concept of our origins? Who was behind this? I think we know. And Satan is no dummy. He's been hard at work trying to deceive people into believing man's ideas over God's. In uh, Job 1, verse 7, Satan says, when the Lord asks, where do you come from? Satan says, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Make no mistake, Satan is just as active now, if not more, as he was during Job's life. So, a good example of Satan's work took place in 1859. Uh, years ago, science believed that life came about by spontaneous generation, a process known as abiogenesis. That's a big word. Uh, but abiogenesis um, is the supposed spontaneous origination of living organism directly from lifeless matter. So years ago, People believed in abiogenesis, that you have something and um, a, a flask of water, and then over time, that flask of water life would suddenly just appear from the flask of water. Well, we know through some scientists like uh, uh, 
um, Anton Livenhook with the microscope. He found that they're microscopic um, creatures in water. Um, but it really was in uh, 1859 when Louis pa Louise Pasteur uh, found that um, life wasn't spontaneously created. So here's a picture, a drawing, a rendering of Louis Pasteur in his lab. Um, his experiments found that life was found in small, incredibly complex organisms and, and cells. This was exciting news. What he did was he basically boiled broth to make sure everything was dead in it, sealed it, and then looked for germs in it. And he also had um, broth that he um, boiled and didn't seal. And the stuff that he didn't seal, life would small single cell organisms would come from that, but the one that he did seal, it wouldn't. So that was proof to him that these organisms were already in the air and they were feeding on that broth. Um, so that was exciting news. Um, most individuals today, including well-educated evolutionists, laugh at the idea of abiogenesis, that you get life from nothing. Yet, Later in 1859, the same year that Louis Pasteur discovered germs, Darwin published his Origin of a Species, which became the driving force, the primary doctrine behind the theory of evolution as we know it today. So don't be fooled by terms. Evolution implies a biogenesis. Only the name is different. You get something from nothing. And I think we're going to take another break uh, right now. Um, so we left off with evolution and I biogenesis. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about um, science and different ways uh, science can support or not support um, creationism.
So we're back. Um, we finished off talking about the theory of evolution and a biogenesis or getting life from nothing, which is pretty much what evolution implies. Um, and now we're going to move into some uh, science, uh, specifically quantum mechanics. Don't be scared. Uh, we're just going to touch upon quantum mechanics. Um, but really, if you look at the science uh, from my generation, uh, science was mostly about factual evidence based on observation and experimentation. That's how science was for thousands of years. Um, it really was this way until the voyage of the Beagle and the theory of evolution. And then in the 20th century with the introduction of quantum mechanics, which is a theory of energy, describes the properties of atoms and even smaller um, particles. Um, so quantum mechanics and incorporates four classes of phenomena or things that occur which for which classical physics um, like speed and rotation and things like that cannot account for. So the physical properties of some things, um, entanglement, uh, which is how the energies are all configured, um, you really don't need to, to know the details on these. The principle of uncertainty, which we will cover on, cover a little bit in depth, and wave-particle duality, which just says that like light can either be a particle or a wave at any time. Um, but these are certain things which classical physics, as you're taught in um, in a high school physics classes, they really don't cover and can't answer these things. So that's where quantum mechanics was developed. Um, well, most of the universe is deterministic and measurable, which means you can determine things from measuring it. Uh, you can measure and do a calculation and figure out where something is going to be or where it has been. Quantum mechanics says that there's a world of tiny particles uh, behind everything that's governed by complete randomness. So quantum mechanics says that the world is basically governed by probability or chance. So one of the four major principles of quantum theory is the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, and that's listed right here. Um, it says that it's impossible to know both the speed and the position of a single particle at the same time. So I'm a little bit confused by this. So in a nutshell, that part of quantum mechanics says that nothing can be certain and you can only describe things in terms of probability. So if you know the speed of an object, you can um, probably tell where it's at. If you know where the position of an object is, you can probably tell the speed of it, but you can't do both. Um, this is much of what science um, is used to determine an old age um, of the Earth is based upon now. The A, nothing can be certain, and B, we can only describe things as probabilities. What is interesting is that assumptions based on extremely low probabilities, way outside the chance of winning a lottery, are deemed or considered certain. Um, one individual who didn't like this idea of chance was a gentleman, I believe we've all probably heard of, Albert Einstein. Um, he wrote a letter in 1926 to a really good friend of his, Max uh, Born, who was very deeply uh, involved in quantum mechanics. And uh, he wrote, uh, and I'm, I'll try to pronounce the, the German, Jedfalls bin ich übersucht, sab der nicht verfällt. That's in German. I'm not, I don't speak German, but anyway. Um, what that translated in English means, at I, at any rate, am convinced that he, referring to God, does not throw dice. So in this letter, Einstein was upset over the prominent use of probability in quantum mechanics. Einstein couldn't fathom that there was a probability or chance in our existence. He believed that there must be some underlying law of nature that could define atoms and subatomic particles, and that chance wasn't involved. 
And just because we've used probabilities to help us design and build things such as MRIs and for space travel and for gambling, doesn't mean there are not intrinsic laws for which all matter behaves. We just haven't found them yet. Sure, quantum mechanics is interesting, and it can be useful for now, but give it another hundred years until the next theory comes along. It wasn't that long ago when we believed that disease was caused by an imbalance of our four volatile humors. It seems that each generation of science has its own arrogance associated with it. So regarding chance and evolution, a uh, doctor of history, Professor Theodore Rozak, he captured Satan's work very nicely when he said, the main purpose of Darwinism was to drive every last trace of an incredible God from biology, but the theory replaces God with another deity, omnipotent chance. Replacing one God with another, where have we heard this before? Well, God says this in Exodus 20 and verse 3. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. Could absolute faith in the theory of evolution in a long age earth be one of the gods that the Lord refers to when he carved? You shall have no other gods before me. Man can use science to better himself, to help others, and to have a deeper appreciation for God's creation, or to replace God, placing man achievements above God's wonders. The Apostle Paul knew about this and documented it in his first letter to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 20 and 21, Paul writes, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Here, Paul is warning Timothy to guard the teaching that he had been given from being polluted by the false ideas of the world, which is happening today. Paul then describes the kind of things that he wants Timothy to guard his mind from. Paul's literal intention of this command was for Timothy to avoid arguments from men who claimed that they had intellectual oppositions to the gospel. Paul knew that many men would claim that their wisdom and knowledge kept them from believing the truth. But their so-called knowledge was not knowledge at all. It was falsely so-called knowledge. We can certainly apply God's point, or Paul's point, to the more specific subject of modern day science. For over 150 years now, ever since Charles Darwin's Origin of a Species was published in 1859, and evolution became the accepted theory of the origin of life, the mainstream scientific community has been in direct opposition to God's word and what it has to say about how the universe and life began. Christians often become fearful and timid when they hear that science seems to contradict the Bible. Some allow their faith to waver and crash. Others just try to make the Bible fit with a new prevailing scientific theory, which we discussed earlier with the, the day-age creationists. But we need not to be intimidated. We are not on shaky ground as believers. Those who claim to use science to refute the existence of God are the ones who are on shaky ground. Later, in 2 Timothy 4.4, Paul says, And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So very true today. So can science and creation coexist? Absolutely. God allows us to use science to better appreciate what he has accomplished. Louis Pasteur said, a little science estranges men from God, but much science leads them back to him. This is the change that God has made in scientists like Robert Gentry, who we discussed earlier. This is the change that uh, God made in me to allow me to better appreciate the world around me. This is what God wants in all of us. In order to appreciate this, though, we must look to the Bible for guidance. The best place to start is probably found in 2 Timothy verse three, or chapter 3 and verse 16, where Paul writes, All scripture 
is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So notice it doesn't say that some of the scripture, portions of it, part of it, the beginning, the end. No, it says all scripture. I should have uh, highlighted that and underlined it. Um, because it is. It's all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So in the Bible, God has provided some historical facts. Um, I'm going to give a, just a few examples here. Take, for example, the prophecies of Daniel concerning Rome and Greece. Um, the destruction of the city of Tyre. And the destruction of Jerusalem prophesied by Jesus in uh, Luke 21. So based on historical evidence just alone, just from what the Bible says, we have no reason not to believe in the Bible. And as far as our existence in Earth's history, Paul gives us a great summary in Colossians 1 and verse 16, where he says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Not some things, but all things that were created. And in Genesis chapter 1, it starts with, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then over a six-day period, God created the sun, moon, stars, plants, fish, mammals, and us, humans. How do we know that these were six literal days and not eons of time as the day-age creationists, which we already discussed, believe? If we again um, look again at Genesis, we find the phrase, so the evening and morning were a day. It is used six times in Genesis chapter 1. Six evenings, six mornings, six days. Six dates of creation. If God wanted us to believe that creation was over countless eons of time, why didn't he say so? Let's give an example of when God says stuff like this. He, he when he's talking to Abraham in Genesis 13, 16, describing Abraham's descendants, he says, I will make your descendants as dust of the earth. He could have said, it took as many years to create the world as there are grains of sand, but he didn't. He definitively states six days, six evenings, and six mornings. The Bible is perfectly clear about how long each day of creation was. Are there examples of science in the Bible which have been documented and validated? Absolutely yes. The book of Job contains a lot of facts about our world. The book of Job is just really loaded with all sorts of interesting um, scientific facts, uh, things that you can look at and point to to help you um, support creation. Um, take for example in Job 26, 7, he hangs the earth on nothing. It wasn't until the mid 17th century that men discovered that the earth is floating in space, suspended by nothing. Yet, for thousands of years, the Bible had said that the earth hangs on nothing. And history tells us that in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed west and in doing so proved the earth was round. About 2,000 years earlier though, Isaiah, in chapter 40 and verse 22, jotted down, He who sits above the circle of the earth. The Bible has never stated that the earth is flat. Men thought the, the earth was flat, but the Bible has always talked about the earth being round or a circle of, of earth. Um, and the atom is a relatively uh, recent discovery, about 150 years ago. Yet Paul wrote the following in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So the things which we can see were not made by things which are visible. We can rephrase that slightly and say the things which we see are made by things which are invisible. I believe he's talking about things like atoms and molecules, things which we can't see. In the mid um, 19th century, there was a gentleman named Matthew Maury. He took God's word to test. In Psalms 8.8, 8, he read, 
the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Matthew Maury was confused by that, so he took it upon himself to find these paths of the seas that the Bible refers to. He spent years looking, but he found them. And these are what we now know today as ocean currents. Um, before Matthew Maury's time, they weren't uh, known. Uh, he discovered them based on what he read in the Bible, similar to how Robert Gentry, um, in just the past century, in the 20th century, uh, discovered the halos uh, based on reading the, uh, the line from the uh, book of Exodus. So where else in the Old Testament is God's creation mentioned? One only has to skim through Psalms to find many examples. Here are a few. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That comes from Psalm 33, 6. And in Psalm 111, 4, we have, He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. To be remembered. Unfortunately, many have forgotten. So can science be used to validate creation? Are science and theology compatible? They are not only compatible, but scientific discoveries can actually heighten the beauty of creation. So the difference in belief in creation during Moses' time and our own is that science allows us to gain a better perspective of the greatness of God if we let him. So science can be used to provide evidence for creation, intelligent design, and a short earth history. And we'll discuss that a little bit more detail when we come back from this break.
So we're returning again. Uh, we left off uh, with this uh, line here that says the difference between our belief in creation during Moses' time and our own is that uh, the way our science has developed, it allows us to gain a better perspective of the greatness of God if we let him. Um, so now I'm going to take this opportunity to use some science from today, um, from, from present time, um, and look at how that can be used to enhance or create um, or show um, and support creation. Uh, so the first one is mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so mitochondrial DNA uh, it comes from the mitochondria, which is a part of a cell. So a cell in any living organism has um, different... Uh, um, pieces of it, uh, like a nucleus, mitochondria is one of them, ribosomes. So the mitochondria DNA that's in cells um, is passed down from uh, generation to generation by mothers. It's only passed on by mothers. If anybody watches the forensic TV shows on uh, um, Netflix or anything like that, they may see that sometimes they use mitochondrial DNA uh, to nab the bad guys. But what uh, mitochondrial DNA has, tells us is that it points to a single female ancestor. Let's, for the sake of argument, call her Eve. Uh, to me, this is a really uh, good example of science uh, that we use today that supports uh, creationism and the Bible. Um, the second one is a seven day work week. Uh, or seven day week, not a work week, seven day week. So there's no lunar or solar explanation for a seven day week as there is for a length of a day, a month, or a year. Um, but there's a lot of history surrounding a seven day week. Between 1793 and 1805, the French tried a 10 day week. And between 1929 and 1940, the Russians tried a five-day week and a six-day week, but these have always been thrown aside in favor of a seven-day week. They've always failed miserably. Um, people couldn't get adjusted to it. Um, and, and why is that? Uh, well, science has yielded an answer. There's, our bodies work on a seven-day biorhythm. We're in a rhythm, um, and over the period of seven days, that's how our bodies uh, work and rejuvenate and, and reconstitute things that we need in our body. Um, and this is not only found in humans, but even in some simple organisms, and even some simple uh, single cell organisms. But why a seven day cycle? Because that's how we were made. It should come as no surprise, the Bible tells us so. God wants all his creation to rest on the seventh day. In Patriarchs and Prophets, on page 111, Ellen White um, summarizes this beautifully with, The reason appears beautiful and forcible when we understand the days of creation to be literal. The first six days of each week are given to man for labor, because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. On the seventh day, man is to refrain from labor, in commemoration of the Creator. I think it's beautiful. Uh, and recently, the scientific field of particle physics is giving us a peek into God's creative energy. The current theory for how uh, atomic particles are made is called the string theory. Uh, the string theory um, explains um, the matter as strings or membranes of vibrating energy. Um, in 2005, a theoretical physicist who works at Harvard, Lisa Randall, uh, published a book called Warped Passages, and interestingly, the book is subtitled, Unraveling the Mysteries of the Universe's Hidden Dimensions and Knocking on Heaven's Door. Um, I do like that subtitle. Uh, in her book, Dr. Randall describes energy strings and compares them to vibrations produced in the air by vocal cords. I think that's interesting. In the first chapter of Genesis and in the first chapter of John's Gospel, 
we find an explanation for those vocally analogous or similar vibrations. Could this be describing God's voice in Genesis chapter 1 when he spoke and in the first chapter of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? Are the vibrations discussed in particle physics God's voice creating matter? I, for one, am a believer. In Europe, there resides the Large Hadron Collider. I'm sure maybe you've heard of this in the news. It's a 16 and a half mile long particle accelerator. The primary goal of this and the billions of dollars that were spent was to prove the existence of the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is also known as the God particle. This particle is thought to hold all matter together. I find it really uh, interesting that it, this is called the God particle. So what is this God particle? The Bible holds the answer. In 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 8, John says, God is love. If God created all with his word, and the word is God, I think the energy that holds our universe together is, in fact, God's love. I think there's no greater source of power that I can think of than God's love for what has created, God's love for us. And if that's not enough, consider a single organism that is able to travel about using an elaborate process to move under its own power, has an intricate digestive system which processes food into usable energy, forms relationships and can communicate with other species, and reproduces to create offspring. That describes many, many single-cell organisms. And that sounds pretty complicated. Um, but the single-celled organisms we're talking about, they lack um, nerves, lungs, a circulatory system. The 206 bones that we have, we have over 600 muscles which allow us to walk, talk, and to chew. We have ears, eyes, and noses. Uh, and, and sensors in our um, fingertips uh, and taste for sensing the world around us and we can think consciously. So when you think about that, when you, if we go back with that one slide and look at what the single, uh, single cell organisms have, the probability that one of these single celled organisms evolved is more than a trillion to one. So, if that's more than a trillion to one, just for single-celled organisms that lack all of these things, in a nutshell, we're infinitely more complex than a single-cell organism. And if the chance of one of them being made is a trillion to one, what are the chances that we were just evolved? It's unspeakable. The, the odds are unfathomable, really. Um, I think it's beautiful and wonderful to consider just how complex we are and how creative God was when he made us. Yet people still question the Bible. Maybe it's because the Bible doesn't provide a lot of detail regarding our origins. Why didn't God give Moses more information, greater detail, for the book of Genesis? Would it have mattered? How much more explicit could God have been? So what should we believe? Many verses in the Bible emphatically state that we should trust in the Lord. In Psalms 118.8 comes the platform or the base of our uh, faith for creation. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. No bones about it. Creation comes from the God. Evolution is something that man has created, has, we have developed. Uh, God didn't create evolution. God created us. And this is repeated in the New Testament by Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 and verse 5, where Paul says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Again, 
Um, God created men to be wise, to be intelligent, and to think. But we have turned uh, that uh, those wonderful blessings that God has given us and, and gifts that God has given us, we have turned them to things which are not um, of God. We've turned them to things which uh, benefit ourselves, um, and they don't lift God up and show how omnipotent God is and how great his creation is. So what happens when we place our trust in God? We are blessed, blessed with the truth. And this is found throughout the Bible. In Psalm 38, uh, 34, 8, it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. In Jeremiah 17, 7, I don't have a slide for this, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope in is the Lord. So where should we place our trust? What should be the platform of our faith for our origins? God's creation is mentioned in a host of Bible verses in Job, Isaiah, Jonah, Amos, and one of my favorites in Jeremiah 32, 17, where it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. The Lord has shown us numerous times in our history and in our lives that there is nothing too difficult for him. Dr. George Javor, a professor of biochemistry, summarizes this simply with, the greatness of God cannot be exaggerated. There's no hyperbole or no exaggeration in creation. Yes, it is totally unbelievably fantastic. It is amazing, and we can have absolute faith in God. In Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Paul writes, For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor, will thank, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is, is exactly what's happening in the world today. Um, it has happened in the past, it's still occurring, and it's occurring at an increasing rate. Um, humanity's uh, faith and trust in God is faltering. Uh, many hearts are darkening. The world is darkening. We need to stand up um, and be truthful to the Lord and have faith in the Lord. So what is the truth of our existence and how do we know the truth? Psalm 85.11 says, The truth shall spring out of the earth. One only has to go out in nature, um, outside, um, see the glorious things that God has created uh, and has shared with us each and every day to see what that truth really is. And uh, God told Job in uh, chapter 37 and verse 14, Listen to this, Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. If we would all just take a moment and just go outside, stand still, and take in all that the Lord has created. There is just so much from the, the massive stars in the sky um, to the tiniest uh, insects and microorganisms to a blade of grass, how the, the trees change color in the fall. There's so many things in this world that God has created that are unbelievably beautiful. And if we just take a few minutes to really look at the beauty that God has placed and the love that he has put into his creation, um, I think it definitely will increase um, not only our faith, but will increase our connection with, with God. So, how did God do all this? In Patriarchs and Prophets, we are provided an insight. Uh, Ellen uh, White writes, um, Just how God accomplished the work of creation, he has never revealed to men. Human science cannot search out the secrets of the Most High. His creative power is as incomprehensible as his existence. And it's true. Um, Science cannot search out the secrets of the Most High. What science can do is reveal um, just how 
powerfully magnificent God's creation is, um, but I don't think we'll ever know um, until that day when the Lord comes again uh, just how the Lord did all this. And as John stated uh, in chapter 8 and verse 32 of his gospel, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So what is this freedom? God tells uh, Isaiah in chapter 65 and verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Rejoice forever, creation. The truth brings us an everlasting life to rejoice and enjoy what the Lord God has created. For me, for you, for everybody that's on this great planet Earth. I want to thank you. That concludes the presentation for the Creationism Honor. Uh, again, um, Everybody needs to uh, go outside um, and sit down, uh, take a walk, uh, write a paper, and give it to your director on the diversity and the beauty of God's creation and what you've seen in the world around you. And again, it doesn't have to be um, a zoo or a national park. Um, God's creation and the beauty of his creation is seen all around us um, in everything that's out there from rocks to trees to plants to animals to insects so just take a moment go out um, uh, write up your thoughts on what you've seen uh, present it to your director and if you have any questions feel free to contact me um, I really appreciate the time you spent uh, I love creation I love what God has given me and I want to thank you for attending this presentation. Blessings.